from the Bay Area's local news station, we bring you this Cron 4 News special report. Coming up next on our Cron 4 News special, Surviving the Coronavirus, we'll be joined in studio by an infectious diseases doctor who will answer your questions about the coronavirus. Welcome back to our Cron 4 News special report on the coronavirus. Joining us right now to answer your questions is Dr. Alexander Evans with Marin Health. He specializes in infectious diseases. So this is the person that we'd want to talk to to kind of demystify coronavirus. There's a lot of questions out there. Oh, there are a lot of questions out there. Plus, there are a lot of questions I can't answer out there, too. It's, because it's still a mystery, yeah, this thing. Yeah, okay. this is still a very new virus. It's, it, there, there's a lot of research being spurned by uh, the amount of cases that have been unfortunately seen throughout the rest of the world. But you say the rest of the world. Has it surprised you at all the amount of concern and fear here in the Bay Area amongst maybe patients that you have about the virus? Yes and no. Uh, I think the concern is well deserved mm -hmm. uh, just because there are related coronaviruses. We seem to get one every 10 years. Mm -hmm. The SARS epidemic that occurred in 2002 um, had about a 10% death rate. And then this MERS uh, virus, which was about 10 years ago, had about a 30% death rate. So that, that, that was the concern. That's why the, the, there was so much concern there. But the death rate for this, they say, is less than 2%. And all of these cases have been mostly in China. So are, are the concerns founded? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, the death rate has not been confirmed. There are probably a lot of minimal cases or what we call asymptomatic cases, mm -hmm. people with no symptoms. We'll know that denominator eventually once they develop an antibody test where they can check people to see if they have antibodies and they'll just do it to everyone and see if people perhaps may have had an infection and never even got sick in the first place. Actually that brings up a first question. We're answering questions that people have asked on social media uh, in the order that they asked it uh, so that you can answer their questions. Mm -hmm. And the first question comes from Twitter. Uh, the name is Alaire and they ask those who recover from the coronavirus what are the chances of them contracting it again? Is it like the chicken pox or just one at a time? Well, it's definitely not like the chicken pox, so it's a different type of virus. Mm -hmm. So the thought is, however, that there could be some level of protection, but they don't know 100% certain because there's not much research in this yet. So we're just investigating this right now. This virus can mutate, so therefore can mutate enough where you won't have protection. However, they are developing a vaccine for it with the hope that they could guide some sort of protection out there. But the and vaccine would be, what, for next year? I, I, how, how quickly can they make something like that? Well, they're doing it right now. Yeah. Um, I do know that. Uh, they'll have human trials probably within a few months. And so it's on the rapid scale. Multiple companies have taken it on. I just mm -hmm. saw that Sanofi has taken this on just recently. Okay. Another question that we had from a, a viewer who's concerned about their own children uh, is Angelina. She reached out on Facebook to ask the question, how susceptible are children specifically to getting the coronavirus? Are they in one of these... Uh, one of these demographics that could be susceptible to Yeah, because we actually yeah. heard it was more deadly in uh, people who have complications and are elderly. Yeah, I, I think nothing's been published. Uh -huh. However, what we've seen is that it's been older individuals that have been more prone to getting this, at okay. least uh, out of the reports out of China that's been published. Um, a little bit more predominance of men, for whatever reason. Not mm. an overwhelming predominance, but statistically a little bit higher, mm. especially over the ages of like 65 or such. Of course, underlying illnesses like uh, lung disease, mm -hmm. COPD, would be a big risk factor. There haven't been as many ch uh, childhood cases um, reported, but that's still really unclear. Okay. Just because of the fact that a lot of probably data has been not so-called told to us from mm, China. Yeah. And that's the difficulty thing here mm -hmm. is the, the level of secrecy among the Chinese government. I mean, Wuhan, they've got the entire city of 11 million people under lockdown and getting some of the data out has been difficult. Also, maybe they don't know if the kids had the regular flu or the or, or this because the, it looks so much like the flu oh, and oh yeah. the kids it's get the flu similar. and seem very to recover. Very similar. And the fact is they have so many cases, they can't test everyone because these tests are expensive. These are diagnostic PCR tests, which are probably around 100, 200, 300, depending on where you're running the test per test. 
pr testing for not only the, the flu virus, but also for this novel coronavirus. And then also the test has to be accurate, too. Right. And so actually, they I, I know when one particular city, they said, we're not going to uh, judge by the test in China. They said, we're just going to tell you if they had the symptoms and we're going to add that to the list. So then there were even more people counted as yeah. infected. And that's and that's where the the numbers get a little squirrely right. and, and not completely accurate. But we're seeing cases outside of China in, in well, I would say, places that probably aren't going to fudge the numbers, right. per se. And so we're going to be getting a lot of research out of this, a lot of information. It seems like I'm reading something new almost every single week published out of major journals about this, which is exciting, nervous, a lot of, a lot of different feelings. What about a question as simple as, as this viewer had? Uh, Catherine on Facebook says, how long does the coronavirus stay in the body? Now that question mm. seems like it should be easy enough to answer, or, but is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, what we know is the incubation period is generally between about two to maybe seven days, longest being 14 days, and that's why they're quarantined people for that long okay. so you should see illness within that two-week period however when you do have illness it's not really clear depending on how, what type of severity illness how long you're gonna have it for uh -huh. generally a run-of-the-mill cold will be about a week okay maybe a few days but some people who have really severe disease who are hospitalized could have it for weeks perhaps and are you contagious that entire time or do we know that yet some people are more contagious than others. Okay. If it's related, we, well, it's, we know it's related to these other coronaviruses. Some people are hyper spreaders, can be spreading it more than other people. And you don't know who that's going to be when, they, when, okay. you, when you're seeing them in the hospital. What you do is you test them with these molecular tests to see if they are spreading it still. So cases that are being tested for here in the United States, there's no doubt they're constantly testing them okay. to see if they're still positive. But because we do know that it's spread person to person, and as you said, when people cough or sneeze, the droplets in the air, a lot of people are wearing masks. And we do have a viewer, Kevin, who asked on Facebook, should I buy masks for my family, and how often should we wear them? Well, buying masks for the family may be difficult because there's probably a lot out of stock because people have been buying them. Right. Now, I can't say that masks are going to be 0% effective. There's going to be some positive effect in terms of preventing, even with a simple face mask, right. certainly with something called an N95. That's one of those uh, tight respirator masks. Right. Um, the question is how good you are at wearing the mask, how touching the mask and right, right. taking it off properly. That's where it's, you, you get trouble because healthcare workers, if they take off their mask in a poor way, are going to make themselves sick. You know, we see video like we're seeing right now, people wearing just standard surgical masks or just sort of fabric masks is that even effective? Is it better than nothing? <laughs> well, nothing's been published on how effective it is, but we do know it's effective for other viruses. Uh -huh. And that's why we wear that even in the hospital setting. Okay. So to extrapolate that to the coronavirus, that's probably not the dumbest idea. Um, we do even know it's perhaps even minimally effective, like a simple face mask for a, a contagious illness like tuberculosis. Not 100%, probably 50%, but it's better than zero. But, okay, then if a little is better than nothing, is a lot better than a little? Like the people that are head to toe covered, uh, you know, oh, with like face masks. Medical personnel? Well, we've seen video, medical personnel yeah. and, and, you yeah. know, other people who want to be extra cautious, their eyes are covered, everything is covered. Well, they are being extra cautious in the hospital setting in terms of almost being head to toe mm -hmm. because people who are hospitalized tend to be sicker, tend to be maybe that hyper spreader. And so they're being extra cautious with eye protection, face protection, full body protection, um, and as well as being very uh, critical in terms of how to take it off and not and then washing off afterwards. That's the important um, thing, isn't it? Shown to be, I'm assuming, pretty effective. Uh, we'll see if there are any hospital-acquired cases in the United States. I have not heard of any. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have had cases here. Uh, we haven't heard of any propagation, at least in the hospital setting. That did occur in China, and that was the concerning thing. Right. However, that primarily, at least in report, was um, for people who came in with atypical symptoms, meaning people with not the typical symptoms, like an individual coming in with GI complaints or gastrointestinal complaints, right. and they got a cough later on. They spread it to a lot of healthcare workers. That's the concern because this virus could present with just a GI illness in about maybe 10 percent maybe okay. I, I, that's a rough number all right um, well, well we'll continue taking your yes. questions we'll be right back with more of this special edition on cron for surviving the coronavirus 
Welcome back to the Crown 4 News special report on the coronavirus. We're taking uh, and your questions and answering questions from Dr. Evans of Marin Health. And uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, a viewer has a question about products shipped from China. Mm. And uh, their question specifically came from Facebook. Uh, can we get the coronavirus from products shipped from China? This coming from uh, Justice. Uh, and this would also uh, cause me to ask you, how long can this live on a surface? Because right. this person might be concerned. It's made in China, they're touching it, they're shipping it to me, and then I'm going to open it. Right. I think the likelihood of uh, getting something uh, from an item shipped from China is, is next to zero. Uh, I can never say 100% certain, but it, I would say next to nil. Because um, how long does it live on a surface? We don't know exactly with this virus, but we extrapolate it from other related viruses that are as just, just as bad as it. Um, probably at most seven days, but usually less than that. Usually less than five days would be on a surface. And it really depends on the temperature, the humidity, the type of surface. Um, it's just not going to survive that long. It's a different story when you're talking about other types of viruses like the stomach flu virus, norovirus, and things like that. Those mm. can last in surfaces for quite some time. Well, it's oh. interesting you said norovirus because that's like a cruise ship number one is that they Oof. clean for that. So when you clean, though, it's not going to be on that counter for that many days, yeah. right? So Yeah, yeah. so cleaning with uh, disinfectants are going to be very effective at killing off this virus. And you'll see it on the ingredients or on the back of uh, cleaning, whether it kills off certain types of viruses. And it has a certain type of kill time, whether right. it's 30 seconds, 60 seconds, in terms of how, how uh, long it takes to kill it. Okay, another viewer question, uh, also from Facebook. Louise asks, what are the chances of survival if you do get infected with the coronavirus? And we kind of touched on this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what's the data showing us right now? The data is showing is that it's certainly less than 5%. It's probably going to be somewhere along the lines of less than 1%. Once okay. we fully understand and develop, develop an antibody test to check really everyone right. that's been in like sort of an environment to see um, how many people have had really low level or asymptomatic infection. Um, thankfully, it's going to be many magnitudes less than these other related viruses, which were way higher, like the okay. mayor's 30%. The original SARS in 2002 was 10%. You're talking about death rates. De yeah, those, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, hospitalization, that's really unclear. I think a lot of the patients here in the United States have been hospitalized. Yeah. Um, but there have been, but most of what I've heard is that their symptoms have been relatively mild and uncomplicated. And I've not heard of anyone needing like intubation or being on a, a mechanical machine. But okay. when it comes to those symptoms, another viewer has a very good question, and it's Madison on Facebook asks, How do you know if you have the coronavirus or just symptoms of the flu? Yeah. You're not going to know. That's the thing. It, it's going to be very very similar. Uh, the most common symptoms that have been published and reported of the coronavirus are fever and cough, which are similar symptoms which you get from the seasonal flu as well as other viruses. So that's that's the difficulty with this particular virus, unfortunately. And with you would have those, to test for both. Well, you, well, right. And I know when my kid gets the flu, they don't do anything. They just say, you got to ride it out. Well, they've tested a lot of people coming back from China. What they, there haven't been that many of them positive for coronavirus. Right. I forgot exactly what the, the percentage was reported earlier in the show. Most of the people that were had symptoms had flu. Yeah. They tested them for that too. Right. The majority had that when they were sick, which is not surprising because the flu is what I call ubiquitous. It's, uh, uh, they estimate about 25% of the human population gets it during a given flu season. So right. it's so common. Okay. Well, we'll be back answering more questions uh, in just a couple of minutes, so don't go away. Welcome back to the Crown for special report on surviving the coronavirus. We're continuing to get questions answered from Dr. Evans of Marin Health. And I think that um, since California has seen people with the coronavirus evacuated and, and, and uh, sequestered out at the uh, Travis Air Force yeah. and then going to SFO to go home, they're slowly being released. A lot of people may wonder, uh, is there any increase of risk to us as they begin to release these people or the fact that they're being treated at hospitals here? Oh, like um, residents in yeah. Uh, is people like here, are we yeah. somehow more exposed? I don't think so. I think that they've done their due diligence mm -hmm. in testing these individuals, following, up, following them up really closely, because there really haven't been that many cases. So they are allotted a certain number of personnel to monitor these people, test these people. Um, I'd have to feel that they're probably the safest ones to potentially get exposed to rather than people who haven't been tested and haven't been followed as uh, strictly. Right. Now, we, uh, you know, all of these flights that are coming in, the most recent one from uh, the evacuees that were aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship in no. Japan. Right. So they had already been on that ship for 14 days. They were at the end of that quarantine period 
and then we sent flights to take them out. Now they're in another 14 day. It, what was wrong with that quarantine that caused us to want to pull them out and put them in another quarantine? It's testing them here and using our di diagnostics here. Uh -huh. uh, doing a almost like redoing your homework mm -hmm. um, okay. and being extra extra cautious probably overly cautious but in this sort of scenario bringing them back to the states uh, I, I, I can see why they would make that decision. Was there any sort of concern about the quarantine protocols that were on that ship? Yeah, and that the quarantine on a cruise ship have to be really difficult and um, you know, given the number of cases, it just kept on increasing almost, almost every day, again, despite yeah. the 500 fan. plus cases. Right. It made sense for them to um, potentially put them back into a, a 14 day quarantine, a more controlled environment, more controlled environment. Okay. At an Air Force base that's meant to do that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, that makes sense. And, and Doc, by the way, has two kids, and you quarantine your kids when they have the flu. Just. I mean, it's. <laughs> I don't know if it works, but <laughs> but you know, it makes yeah. Sense to I mean, do. It, it does make sense to do. I mean, th these vi viruses are tricky. Uh, flu virus, right. other types of uh, run-of-the-mill virus, rhinovirus, and there's there's seasonal coronaviruses that are more mild that are related to this virus but are seasonal. They're very contagious. I mean, they're out there in little droplets. They get on surfaces, and people are touching these surfaces all the time. And so, being extra cautious in your home, really, the key thing to prevent this is is good hand hygiene. Right. Really, 20 seconds, soap and water, uh, singing "Happy Birthday" twice is really what I do. You may even see me in the hospital, kind of mouthing those words, <laughs> honestly. Just to make sure you wash them all. So enough. really, mm -hmm. the number one thing would be people don't wash their hands either well enough or long enough? Oh, absolutely. And good hand hygiene is what stops the stop these other epidemics, the SARS epidemic, the MERS. It's just great protocol, hand mm -hmm. hygiene. The one interesting thing is that a lot of times what we see when these viruses come about, people start washing their hands more mm -hmm. and better. Right. We start to see other infections drop at the same As time. Well. So it'll be interesting to look at the data because we did see this uh, years ago when other right. other viruses came about like the H1N1 when that hit hit the hit the circuit right, about right, 10 right. years ago we saw other infections sort of drop because people because it prevents all infections or sure. a lot of infections a really general well. practice mm -hmm. altogether really great have you seen with Marin health people come in and maybe think do I have it and asked you because and then you say no they really had the flu since we yeah that's been, that's been you know, you know asked mm -hmm. in, in, in the ER setting sure. not really once they hit the floor is when I see them uh, but yeah, that has been asked and we've been working really closely with our local health department mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how to approach patients like this and how to follow them up. So I suppose the takeaway for a lot of folks, if they don't want to get the virus or just want to protect themselves, you said, wash your hands. Uh, during the break, you said, make sure you cough in your elbow or do something to help prevent all the water droplets. Cough from etiquette, that, that's, that's yeah. the term. Right, yep. right. Okay. And uh, something's better than nothing, there, hence the mask, if you yeah, want to do it. I, I, I can't say the mask is 100% preventative. Uh, I wouldn't say it's zero. I mm -hmm. think uh, tanking it off is really the error people make. If you just touch the front of the mask, you, you've just infected your hands. But you said you'd wear the mask and you do at home for the flu prevention, so not even for this coronavirus. It, it, it is, it, there's going to be a percentage in terms of prevention, in terms of flu prevention. There's no doubt that with a simple face mask. I mean, yeah. we wear it in the hospital. It's not just for fun. If somebody's going to cough directly in your face, um, it, it may get in through your eyes, and that's why a lot of times we also wear eye protection in the hospital setting, especially if they're coughing quite a lot or you're doing a procedure where it makes them cough. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing's 100%, but I can't say it's 0%. There's going to be some degree of effectiveness there, maybe 50%. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. okay. When do you suppose we're going to hear more from the World Health Organization, or when, when is the data going to come in that you need to get a better handle on coronavirus? I think the data is, is going to be coming in within a month or two. Okay. I think we're going to get, uh, especially once we have more analysis of these patients in Japan. Mm -hmm. I think Japan has a... Uh, a, a great uh, medicine uh, mm -hmm. there in terms mm -hmm. of testing, diagnostics. Uh, they're doing research right now in terms of treatments. Okay. Um, you know they're doing vaccine research there as well as in the states. So I think we're going to get a lot of information probably from them and probably you know, you know more from China too, but, but certainly from these other countries, which now in Japan, what, 500 plus cases right. I see reported. Right. We're going to get some pretty good research from that, no doubt. Well, okay. let me tell you, we got a lot of good information from you, even though you said there's so much you don't know. Uh, a lot of unknown. We Thank appreciate the answers. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Evans of Marin Health, and we'll be back with more in a minute.